Great sites. Did they give a cost that what it would cost to uh, sponsor one? It doesn't cost you anything if you're sponsoring. FEMA will pay up to $8,000 to fix the grave site, which that's usually enough to fix everything. Um, so what happens is that Ryan with the Cemetery Task Force, he's going to look at every grave site that's unsponsored and he's going to group them together, like pull them together, and have every single person that's willing to sponsor it sign their affidavits and all the money is going to go into that pot and then he's going to hire someone to go and fix everything. They just got to have somebody sponsor you just say that they're going to sponsor. FEMA can't <coughs> give the money for that because it's individual, considered individual assistance. They can't give it to the parish. They can't give it to a nonprofit. It has to go to an individual. Can mm -hmm. you get the names of the uh, individuals? That uh, we can ask him if, if you need to know that. I guess we can certainly ask him. And the location, please. Okay. Thank you. Okay. What, what about our uh, grave sites? I think we have some that we have the parish actually owns. Yes. They're handling that for us as well, the cemetery task force. Do we need to have volunteers for that too, or is that going to be taken care of through the parish? Everything is going to run through the cemetery task force. We need volunteers for both. Okay. Is this just for the parish owner, or is this for all for the cemetery? Yeah. For every cemetery, private and publicly owned. They see your name, basically. They just need a name. Yeah. And the affidavit, you know, releases you from any financial uh, obligation to cover the cost that isn't covered by FEMA. It's just saying that what they're going to do is FEMA is going to give the individual, the volunteer, the check, and you're going to endorse it and give it to the cemetery task force for them to go fix it. Okay. That's the extent that. of your involvement. How, how about the, uh, uh, the, the uh, reburial of the... The ones that's that have left, that, 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 that too, I don't everything. know what it's going to cost. It covers everything. Okay, that's the re and everything. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they need a, a lot of volunteers. You don't have to live in the parish to, to sponsor anyone. You don't have to live in that community. They just need uh, willing, good Samaritans that would do this for a family. I know, because we have, a, uh, I was passing through East Creole the other day, and I remember there was a little graveyard about this side of Gator and Ban Banjo and them's. Mm -hmm. Right off the road, in, in the bushes and trees, there's there's a little private graveyard there or whatever. I know we have them all over. But okay. Anybody else have any, any questions for Katie? Or? 225-326-6056. Okay. You finished, Katie? Thank you, ma'am. It's on our website? It's on our website, and it's also on our Facebook page. Okay, Katie, let's see, before Mr. Urban, uh, Cobalon, Blue Cross Insurance, Mr. Urban. Good morning. Good morning, sir. <coughs> Good morning. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <coughs> this is a mid-year review of the Blue Cross Medical Insurance for the as far as the premiums collected. Paid out now, and this is on a rolling 12 month period which ended uh, February 2021. And that report we have in front of you. I apologize for the small numbers on there, I had to submit to see some of that stuff. And it was suggested that I don't use red uh, colors anymore, that I should use green. <laughs>
very first claim on there is a COVID claim, which is one million one hundred thirty-two thousand. So it's a an expensive situation that's going on right now, and that does make a difference in the claims experience of the parish. Our renewal is coming up September the 1st. We should know where we stand on the numbers somewhere around the first part of June. Uh, last year we had a 13% rate increase, which was the highest increase we've had in a number of years. Uh, they fortunately have been somewhere between 5 and 7 and 8%. But hopefully uh, we can get some reasonable renewal numbers coming up in the first quarter of June. Now, the good thing about these numbers, um, any claims over 125000 is uh, <coughs> given to the reinsurance company. So Let's say it again. Any claims <coughs> over 125,000, reinsurance companies take over. So they pool those numbers, so it's not going to impact this group as horrible as those numbers might be. Look like it's uh, it's not going to be impacting the group this that hard as far as these numbers. Are. I thought the federal government had said something about. Picking, absorbing the cost of all this COVID-19 costs to residents. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. I thought I'd heard one time on the news that, that the federal government would pick up the cost of anything related to the COVID-19. Well, that would be nice, but I'm, yeah. I'm not aware of that. Noticing uh, here um, some expensive drugs, prescription brand drugs. Um, what would that What would that consist of? Something that costs you thirty something thousand dollars for a. You know that is a mysterious claim. Every time I see that uh, explanation as to what that claim is, um, it's it's a mixture of the cost of the medicine. Uh, diagnosis this this particular claim uh, and I guess maybe for the lack of having a better diagnosis they put prescription brand drugs on there okay because here's one for 136,496 and it, and it could be uh, it could be related totally to, to, to medicine it depends on what's being administered because some of these drugs uh, yeah. you know yeah, the they do one. get a little 342. 342. Jesus. Most of them are drugs. I mean, a lot yeah, of them. Yeah, you are see drugs. number 10, that's uh, $46,000 of prescription brand drug. Well, number three is number two, two? Uh, no, number two is 342000 Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. But you have 21 claims uh, in, in that uh, large claim group. That's uh, the majority of your. Length, as you can see, it's 3.2 million for those 21 claims. That's crazy. So, Mr. Erickson, I guess you're saying we should expect an increase? In uh, I would expect an increase, but it's, like I said, the 168 to 162% that you see there, uh, it's not going to be a 62% rate increase because they are passing on that, a lot of that, to the reinsurance company. So I'm not going to say it's not going to be, you know, a small increase or a large increase. We don't know until all the numbers come in. So we're getting close, and hopefully it's, you know, we've been in those high numbers before, and we've come up with some reasonable rate renewals. But I don't have a crystal ball, so I can, yeah, it don't take much. To, to could tell you where that's going at this point. But I just wanted to give you that picture I guess you might say at this point in time and let you know that uh, we'll be back sometime at the end of uh, May or 1st of June with some renewal numbers. Is Mr. Irvin, this is uh, showing 
four million, and we paid him two million. But I'm looking at the if they take those seven seven high claims out. That's two and a half million. So that's going to bring us down. We should be under our our cap. So it ain't that bad. No, it's not. Yeah. In other words, if you take that, that's why we buy insurance. We're going to have that every now. And then. Yes, you are going to have some some spikes, and we're having one right now uh, over that 12 month period. So it. Uh, Fortunately, reinsurance companies will take some of that burden off of us and, uh, you know, come out with something reasonable. But, yeah, if you went down each one of those claims that are over 125000 just take that number off of the, off the top of that. About two and a half million. Right? Yep. So That's then we would be under a regular premium where we paid in. Yep. <laughs> they want to be somewhere between 80 and 85 percent of premiums that are paid in. We'll be close to that. And you're very, you, in other words, if you take that off, right, because I did the math at, and you're at 87% right now, you take off those big numbers. So you're still just a smidge over it, but. Um, it so, might get better though, because that's one big, big claim. Yeah, and, and we've got a couple of more, three months to uh, put premium in and hopefully no big claims coming out. Yes, sir. Sounds good. Uh, everything else. I don't hear anything. Uh, when we do hear things, uh, we take care of it. And um, I don't know, do y'all have any comments or questions about anything, or do you hear anything from any of the employees regarding the I haven't heard nothing. I haven't heard nothing. So, so I assume you know news is good news. Nope, that's it. Yes, sir. Well, we do. It's probably going to them first. So. Yeah, it does go to them first, but sometimes it will divert to y'all. We haven't heard anything. I haven't heard anything. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. Well, let me know if y'all do have any questions, and I'll be back. And like I said, we appreciate it. Hope some good news. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Irvin. Okay, number five, five district consolidation. Okay, do you want to? Yes. And uh, Mr. Tim DuPont is here to answer any fire related questions, but I'm just going to go ahead and try to explain what we're looking at doing, and we'd like to see how you guys want to move forward. So Cameron Creole, Grantion Air, we're looking at perhaps uh, consolidating those three fire districts into one South Cameron Fire District. I've spoken to Sean Bonsell, he's the fire chief in Grantion Air. He's supportive of it. Um, he would stay on as the captain for the Grantion Air area. And Mr. Tim DuPont is already the fire chief for uh, Cameron and Creole. So that wouldn't look really any different. So we would just promote Tim to the fire chief of the entire South Cameron area and like I said he would have his captains in Cameron, Creole and Grand Chenier, and he would handle all of the fire uh, PIL ratings and everything. Um, we also want to look at him training our uh, road crew. Any road crew that would be interested in, in training for fire, if they were able to get certified uh, and keep up with their hours, they could earn a uh, 50 cent raise per hour for doing that. And every hour that they work for the road crew for 40 hours counts toward our PIL rating for full for firemen. So it would help benefit the entire community, it help get all the ratings down, and then we have one uh, fire district and we could use all the volunteers and all the road crews we have more response to, to force to any of the marsh fires or the house fires. So it's just something that we're looking at. Um, also, we have some fire stations that were damaged. So by doing this, we could eliminate, uh, combine two stations into one. Look at maybe building one at Cameron Rec. We already spoke to Cameron Rec. They have some property available. They would either let us uh, rent or use for free to build that one uh, fire station there, and it would cover the entire area south of the Intercoastal. Well, we, we would do away with the, uh, Tim, if you want to, it's up to you if you want to come speak, but we would do away with the fire station at, uh, while Dwight South was over there, mm -hmm. we would do away with the one by Kirk Burley's, and because Timmy and I did demolish everything is within uh, the limits, um, so we and build the one out there at the wreck. Also, um, what else, Tim? We might. Uh, Grand we have Grand Chenier Station. Yeah, stay. And, uh, we'd have to stay. I guess all those would have to stay up. I don't know if you could consolidate any of that. Um, what we're looking at doing too is, is instead of spending all that money to elevate our, like our community center where the fire station is at in Creo, we could start using that the the recreation center on the, on the beach out there and use they got a big gym 
that we could use that for uh, weddings and uh, uh, fur festival or whatever, you know, and uh, instead of trying to spend all that money back in Creole, there's no sense in elevating, trying to elevate that, spend waste money uh, when we can do it all out there. And then the only thing Tim would have left in Creole would be the, the, the newest facility that we've built in the back with uh, the fire trucks. Correct. And um, so we'd save some money there and just go to the front ridge with it. And we feel we could we could provide a better service to those three communities by consolidating at a cheaper uh, tax rate. We uh, consolidate the millages. Of course, that would go to the vote of the people. But when you combine all three districts, we uh, we believe that we could lower everyone's taxes by consolidating it versus leaving it all separate. And what is the which which grant engineer's fire rating right now? Uh, it's a six. Six. And they let everybody know, too, since Tim came on way back, uh, back in the early 2000s, whenever I got on, uh, we were at a 10 back then, which was the worst you could be. Mm -hmm. And uh, within a year or so, with Timmy and some other guys, Mr. Jude and a lot of other people, was able to get us from a 10 to a 4. And at the time, five. to a 5. Okay. And at the time, I think it was almost a, the best in the parish at that time. Yes. Uh, then, since then, he's taken over with Cameron and went from what a 10 in Cameron to a five a five so it's a it's been a blessing it's been a blessing for us everybody's insurance uh, immediately went in half you know I think mm -hmm. so it's been a good deal for us down here what else you want because we're gonna have to ask them I mean, we really just wanted to present this to you, have got. time to, to look at it we'd like your blessing to keep moving forward with identifying the next, the next steps and consolidating it. It would uh, ultimately be up to you guys to do a, a, an ordinance change. You have to change the boundaries. Um, that's something that's fairly easy. The, the more complicated part is getting the tax uh, millages rolled into one. And that does have, you have to call an election for that part. So you would ideally want to do everything simultaneously. Uh, in the interim, while we're working through all that, and uh, Mr. Tom's here, we've kind of been talking. He can go ahead and, and give you more. Go ahead, Tom. Well, on the ta I just want to speak on the tax issue. Uh, there's an AG's opinion. Typically, yes, you'd have, uh, you'd have to have a, a, an election, an ad valorem tax election, which would basically establish a new tax for the new district. And within that, it would also say, well, we will eliminate these three district taxes and replace it with an overall tax. Um, and the question that Katie and I were concerned about, what if the public declined that? Yeah. There's an AG's opinion. 20 plus years ago that said you can con you, if you consolidate and you have now a centralized district that district could still collect the three taxes separately but the money would have to be spent within those geographical districts as they existed before so we it would get past that issue if the public said well no we don't want to replace the I'm saying three because I think there's three five districts in lower Cameron that we're talking about consolidating so that so either way we can make it work from a tax standpoint whether they pass it or not, but if they don't, then we just continue yeah, with the but, existing. But for years and years, just so the people understand, Creole's never had any money. Struggle, struggle, struggle. Grant Engineer and Cameron was all right, but I just hope they would understand that we're trying to do the best thing for the parish and put it all in one where we could uh, make it better for everybody. And if you if if it possibly saves them tax money, they would right. you know, but make sure we'd have to get out there and make sure everybody understands understand that. It, mm -hmm. right. And, and money should never be the reason why you you don't have uh, equal fire protection throughout this parish. You know, so we want to protect every resident equally. We think we can do it this way. We'd like your permission to do it. Um, we also were looking at you know once you consolidate those those districts, then those boards, of course, are uh, no longer needed. You could either do have a, a full uh, South Cameron board with representatives from each community, right. or we could even look at making it just a, a, a owned by the police jury. And Tim would be a full-time employee of the police jury, and we would still use the tax money on the fire protection in those districts, but a, a lot of it would run through our office, and he would answer directly to the jury. I, I think we would, I think we should have Tim on his full-time um, be a full -time you know, it's going to be a full-time job uh, for th and, and let our fire districts, our taxes in the fire district take care of his salary, you know. And 
and you could use your um, your board. You could have maybe a, an advisory board. Still have the members of the community that were interested in it. Let them be the advisory board, a, a subcommittee of the jury, and they can make recommendations and still work with Tim and everything. But Tim would actually be a parish employee. Uh, just one question, and it probably goes to Tom. I thought in the charter for these fire departments, they were all required to have a board. Say it again, Sonny. Required to have what? A board. I think we're actually the board for the fire department. Yeah, I believe. So, so the statute says that uh, you you can act as the board, or you can support, or you can appoint a board. Okay, but once so, we once we've done one, we can we can regress back to yes, the other. Yes, you, you 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 are the creator. You can create, modify, okay. do whatever. And now there's procedures for doing that, um, and I and I would explain it best. It's kind of like your uh, when you abandon a road, you have to announce what you're going to do, you publish it, and then you have so much time and you come back and actually do the consolidation and, and, and make the changes according to the, your ordinance. It's your ordinance. You can and it, you can do it however you choose to do it. Okay, don't misunderstand. I support the issue. I'm just trying to keep from having uh, skeletons come out later on to give us problems. Well, my deal is I like the board because you get somebody from each community representing their community, you know. So the board is not a bad idea to keep. That's just your else decision. Yeah, yeah I, I'd say we keep the board, get two from each community or something. I think members. I, 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 but I think the statute says a, a, a fire district, special fire district board, has, I think it's five members. Five or five. And five is five. And if, if you want more, uh, Mr. Boriak is here. Uh, <laughs> five can, we, we can request a change to have, have a <laughs> we, special provision of 10,000 people or less population can have, you know, however many you want. Six. Five would be fine. Um, is that it, Katie? Y'all good? Yeah. Do you, I guess we just We'd really appreciate y'all's support. I mean, is it something you want us to keep working through? Uh, or we don't want to keep going if you're not going to be supportive of no, it? I think it's good for the It's good for, uh, we, I like Thomas. It's his district, too. So, and then look, other guys would support us. Yeah. We'd do appreciate you, it. Do you need any action from the jury today? No, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you, then, Katie. Thank y'all, guys. Okay. Number six, long-term recovery group. That's me again. Katie. Uh, so we touched on this last month a little bit. Uh, we are creating this long-term recovery group. It is going to be a, a civic organization that's going to function <coughs> independently of the jury. Um, it's going to more or less be like a coalition of community members and uh and representatives of industry, of the jury, and everything. That's how we have it structured. That's how we want it to operate. We want to partner with the Lions Club. The Lions Club could be the fiscal agent for this long-term recovery group. They're already a nonprofit organization. They already have the county structure set up. So uh, essentially it would work. The group would meet. They would make decisions on um, steering projects, uh, recovery projects in the community, accepting any type of donated resources. If it was cash, it would go directly to the Lions Club in a long-term recovery group account. And then this board could uh, uh, create this uh, grant that's gonna be for residents and business owners. You set your criteria, you accept applications, and uh, as you rank your applications, then the Lions Club could vote to disperse funds to the resident or the business owner. So that's how the long-term recovery group would function. I would like to ask that uh, in order for this to work, we're going to need really good uh, members that are able to serve as dual and dual roles. Let them serve on the long-term recovery group, but also be uh, a parish poli uh, police jury employee. We wouldn't want these uh, employees that are participating to have to take annual leave or take off of work or take a cut in pay every time they were working on this long-term recovery group. So that's what I'm here to ask for you from, from you today. We would ask that you would give us the blessing, let our employees that are participating, let them do that on the parish's time and use any parish resources. We'd like to use the building for meetings um, and uh, use the Facebook, use our website, all of it. You're not going to the better of the parish. I mean, that's, that's yeah, and you're not part. you're not like hiring new form, people, right? Sure. Yeah. Uh, that's the second question. You're right. I'd like to hire one paid intern, which is a part-time position. It's someone that is a college student. They would work less than 20 hours a week right now, 
and they would help out in our office for all hurricane recovery stuff, but also be that administrative person for the long-term recovery group. They would set up the meetings, uh, do the minutes, do the agendas, do any administrative tasks that needed to be done for the long-term recovery group. Because everyone that's gonna be working on this group and in the Lions Club, like I said, they all have other full-time jobs and, and we wanna make sure that it gets the, fu the full attention that it deserves, that the work's being done and it's not getting pushed to the back because we're over because the people we're using are overworked or are behind. So that's what I'd ask if we could go ahead and bring in an intern just for this group. They work in our office. Like I said, part time work starts out at eleven fifty an hour, uh, no more than twenty hours a week. If we got a vote on that, I'd like to move that forward. Need to add on need to add on for that? No. Um, Tom, do you think we need any type of formal action for them to let us use that? On Parasite? I think so. Uh, Just maybe a blessing? Uh, it, yeah, I think it would be appropriate to you know, have them approve that. Okay. Well, we'll put it on the uh, the agenda um, for voting if that's the will of the jury. Yeah, you can, I guess. Y'all yeah. no good? That's part time intern. And part time uh, internship and allowing your staff to um, serve the on the long term recovery group as a parish employee on parish time. Right. And that won't be a whole lot of after hours working, I guess, like a lot of uh, Well, and, and that's what we'd like to do. Typically, you would have to have the meetings after hours because uh, you wouldn't want your employees taking off of work to go to this. So instead, if we have a lot of community members and a lot of parish employees doing it, then we could do it during business hours. We could do it during lunch break or something. And, and they don't, we wouldn't have to be burdened with taking any leave. That works. That way it wouldn't be uh, they open a lot of overtime and being no abused overtime or whatever and, and, um, and then they'd be able to you know no, no nights and weekends to get the work that's done to support to Mr. President yes sir. sir I'd like to volunteer my services if they'll have me on this committee sure okay. we'd love to okay. have you yes, sir. put old Sonny on there then uh, I guess while I don't know if this is the right time or not to talk about it but uh, being Katie's talking about an intern I mean I know some of our crews we, we haven't hired people in a while. Um, some have retired and some have passed. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I, I think we need to start looking at some more hands um, as far as our road crews. We do have a finance meeting um, after this meeting. We're going to talk about uh, the road crew and structuring <coughs> and go through their finances and uh, we certainly can make that part of the conversation, Mr. Scott. Because we got a lot of culverts and we need some more people in the field because we got a lot of culverts and ditches and stuff that's going to need to be cleaned. And um, not nobody behind a pen. Somebody's going to be behind a piece of a machine. You know, so okay. that'll work. We need to uh, have a update on how many employees we have. Okay. And, and on another point, we need to make sure the jury's informed that anytime somebody's hired, with the police jury to be notified prior to that hiring. I think that is a courtesy to the jury and nobody should hire without notifying the whole jury of a hiring taking place. Not, not saying you have to get our blessing, it's just out of respect and, and a notification prior to the person being hired. Let everybody know. For the staff. Sir? Anybody else got any? Katie, that's it for that long-term recovery? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay, I guess it's going to be you again, Katie. Uh, actually, I'm going to let Ms. Whitney handle this one. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Number seven, Jetty Pier damage. It's Wendy. Yep, it's me. <clears throat> um, I've given you all some pictures on your desk of the pier itself. Um, liability issues are an, a problem at the moment with, with all the hurricane damage. Um, I'm not talking about the buildings, I'm talking about the pier itself. <coughs> uh, there, there's large sections of it missing. The rocks that were aligned up against the wall have been washed out. The con pieces of the concrete slabs have all been, like it's fallen apart. Some of the piers themselves are not structurally sound. Uh, we are going to have someone go out there and post signs for no trespassing and that types of thing. 
um, so that we can make sure that nobody's on it. But I would like y'all's permission today, still dealing with the insurance and the long-term recovery on what we're going, uh, what funding we will have to rebuild or replace, restore, or fix, however y'all, whatever word you want to use. But right now, what is currently there is not structurally sound based off some engineering reports that we have had and some insurance information uh, that it needs to be, a large section of it needs to be removed, if not all of it, because the, the debris, it's hanging, the railings and stuff are hanging off the concrete. Some of it's in the water, some of it has floated, you know, like uh, further down. If you try to park a boat up against it, it there's so much rock and debris there that it, it's, it's just a hazard all the way around. We would definitely not want someone to get up on it and get injured, that it is just not safe. So it needs to be demoed then. Demo yeah, at this point in time, that's <coughs> what I'm asking for, um, for us to be able to move forward with removing it for, this, for a safety hazard and a liability issue for us. Um, and then, then our re, you know, in our recovery, that puts us where we, what we would be able to do with it, with the funding and stuff that we will receive. Is a PW uh, assigned board yet? Not, not an actual number, but we are working with our HGA people on that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, we would never want to get behind the ball on that. Oh, no, sir. I mean, no, sir. I, right now, today, for me, it's, um, I mean, dealing with the insurance and all that kind of stuff, looking at the liability issues of, for, because of what it looks like now. I mean, it, it took several months for us to even be able to get out there for the insurance adjusters and, and the engineers to even get out there to be able to look at all of it. And it's just not, uh, it's not safe. Yeah, the biggest concern ready. is for those recreational fishermen that maybe aren't familiar with the area. With the, the warm weather coming, there's gonna be a lot more traffic out there. And uh, we're concerned that a, a boat is going to run into the pier because they're not going to see it. Uh, some of it is below the water. They're going to run on it, and we just don't want anyone to get hurt. And, there. and there's no lighting on it right now as well because the storm tore what the solar lightings that we had, all that's been torn down. So, I mean, even with the fog, you, you cannot see it at this point in time. And uh, it's, it's just a... I know, like, on our docks, the uh, Coast Guard recommend you to have a flashing light on it. So, I mean, there's portable ones we might need to get the shared property to go Right. Up there, uh, just keeps running into it. Yeah, they got at least from now. They got temporary. They got a. Ron was here. Yeah. I don't know where he went, but Ron was here. But I had planning on going out there and putting some signs and, and maybe a light. Yeah, we are gonna light it. Put the lighting. We're gonna put the signs, but still, uh, we feel that in the event someone didn't the lights weren't enough and the sign wasn't enough and someone were to to wreck their boat and there was a fatality you know i just still i don't think the jury would want to live with that even though you did have all the proper precautions out there it's still something that we would never want there to there's no. a whole probably 30 foot section at the end that there's nothing that it's just the post sticking out of the ground and in, in some places it's they're broke where the concrete had fallen and hit it so I mean, none of it's none of that's stable, and then all those slabs are missing. No, we don't have no problem with uh, mm -mm. pulling no. that up doing what no. we got to do. We just don't. In if, the meantime, we got to. Yes. Yeah. 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 Scott, sir. I like that. Go ahead, sir. A couple quick questions. One, uh, we, do we still have access to that no. area? Mm -mm. To the what? Do we have access? To the yeah. out there. Yes, we can get out there. Yeah, but uh, will, we, will the public be able to get out there? No. Mm -hmm. No. I don't, right I don't, now, no. no. Will we be able to relocate, or will we lose our funding through, through FEMA if we don't? No, we could. If 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 that arose where we choose to do it some something else, you know, take the money and do something else, it would just be an alternative project. But putting a pier back or putting something back is is not out of the question. It's just something that we need to address at some point in time. No, but today, the problem is. We, don't, we can't hazard. wait on FEMA right now. No. Yeah. They're six months out before anything, and, and that's the summer season. And if we wait till FEMA gives us the money to do, to to repair it, then um, someone could get hurt this summer. Well, that's why we want to just go ahead and get your permission to address just that part right now while we work through FEMA. Well, that's the reason I'm asking these questions. Is if we're doing that part, we may want to do. We may have to demolish the whole thing if we can't have access to it. We don't yeah. leave anything for anybody to get hurt on. 
No, well, we could relocate. We should be able to relocate, say, go to Redford Beach with a pier or somewhere else. Well, let me say this real quick. We are we are looking at the rest of it, but that's the waterways are the you know uh, initial concern. People being that being a hazard. No one's going to run a boat on the ground. Well, maybe. Uh, uh, into a building, right. it, the initial concern right now is the hazard of the pier itself. So that being taken down today, not physically, but you know, y'all giving us the permission to move forward with that is more important than what we're doing with the buildings. I, we're still working on the entrance stuff with the buildings. I would think it is. I mean, well, we have a significant investment in that project, so I want to make sure that that doesn't go away. We don't yeah, lose we, that. We need to exactly. Yeah. You know, I, I would just, say I just need y'all's blessing to I move I think forward. everybody's in agreement that it oh, needs yeah. to be uh, taken down and we can look at relocating. Yeah. We need a vote so, on that, Tom? Mm -hmm. no, no. I don't think just, just to do the demo of the hazardous, no, I think they <laughs> just need y'all's blessing. I think, we, I think we're all in agreement that it needs to be taken down, so. Okay. On a, uh, Mr. President, on a separate yes, issue, but one that's probably as important as this is the road sign. Road signs? Road signage. We just got a bunch in. We're starting to put them up. Okay. That's as essential as right. people can get killed. Yeah, it took we, a while to get them in. We have, an, we, we have signs. Yes, sir. And we are making it a priority to be put they up. They started this week putting them back up. Thank okay. you. Thank y'all. And nothing like Rita now. Let's make sure it's uh no, we done. done it ourselves. <laughs> yeah, we don't need twelve signs on one road. Yeah. So, Just uh, what we need out there, but let's get them up. Yeah. Okay. Is that thank you, ma'am? Yes, thank you, Miss Wendy. Yes, sir. Okay. Let's see y'all with glasses where I can see. Number eight, review agenda. Oh, does anybody just, I don't I don't have any public comments, so I guess yeah, nobody I do. you do I, I need to find out. Uh on the <laughs> debris removal part. Roadside debris removal, where are we at with that? Okay, so as of And how much longer, Katie? And how much longer being Glee Axe? How much longer is yeah, going that's what Okay, I'm so all right, well I won't go through how much we can pick that. So we are working on a punch list right now. Uh, once we have a formal punch list, then we're gonna designate a a, a date, a deadline. We're looking at possibly um, April sometime as being final pass punch list and uh, let series go on to, to their other jobs. Is them craters that they dug on the side of them roads going to be included in that punch list? It, that, yes, they sir. To, yes, sir. that they told us uh, several times that they were going to fix back? Yes, sir. That's part the of the roads punch that list. they broke too. Now, we'll, we'll develop the punch list. It'll be fixing those roads, fixing everything. Um, we'll have an estimated cubic yardage in each community, um, and they'll be working on the punch list. And as long as they're in the area working on the punch list, if any debris comes out while they're there, we'll still collect it. But once we set that final date, then there'll be no more trucks in the area. So anything that comes out <laughs> after that date will be the responsibility of the landowner. But anyone that knows that they're not going to be able to get their house demoed and pushed to the road because they don't have insurance or they're waiting on insurance, they want to just go ahead, uh, give us a, about a, 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 another week. We're working on a program where you can do intake applications. We'll announce it on Facebook. We'll announce it on our, our website. We'll start releasing that site. They can go in and put their information and upload pictures and go ahead and start pre-qualifying for the private property debris removal program. Good. Is that where the stumps are going to come in now? Yes, sir. Okay. Stumps will be a part of the private property debris removal program. It does have to go to FEMA uh, and be approved, but we'll start working on that in another, I but think uh, our estimated is in two weeks. But the residents will have to make an application. Yes. Can yes. someone else make the application for them? Yes, we can assist them with anything. We're going to have to collect. You don't just say you want to participate. I'm sure people remember after Rita, you have to find out uh, easements. Right. You're going to have to actually, this is new, you're going to have to provide insurance settlement statements showing that you did not receive money 
to uh, for demoing. And if you did receive money, then you need to provide that insurance state, uh, settlement statement and then the quote of how much it's going to actually cost to show that you don't have enough insurance money to cover the full demo. Okay. That's all information that we're going to collect. Uh, the OEP office is going to be the lead agency on that. They're working on it right now, setting up the program and the protocol. Mm -hmm. And we'll go once we go live. We'll announce it. Uh, we'll put the website live, and we'll start reaching out to everyone. A good, yeah, a good uh, mm -hmm. flyers or whatever it'll take to get the word out to the yeah. to the residents. We, Not we everybody does do. Facebook. I know y'all know that. Right. Yeah. And, and right now our deadline is May twenty eighth. We have to have all of the uh, right of way debris collected and disposed by my May 28th. May 28th? May so 28th. They, they we can request an extension, but that one's not guaranteed. Uh, the first not, one is usually rubber stamped. It's what did February to something? It was February 28th. We got it extended to May 28th. That's good. And so, uh, yeah, and so we're looking at with the conclusion of the debris removal services if we can wrap that up in April then we'll open our dump sites back for for everything that's what I was going to ask you how that was my next question yeah mm -hmm. how the dump I get a lot of requests from the residents and, just go back to the dump and we will we'll open it up for everything and go back to normal operations and they, the y'all's dump dumps look good huh? in Grand Lakes dumps yeah they can't dump nothing but uh, household yeah. goods yeah. that's what I'm saying household stuff but y'all's dumps ours down here we they haven't been fixed Creole's yet, have they? almost ready to open, and then um, Shane and, and Miss Emily and them have been working on uh, some temporary office space for a lot of these dump sites because the buildings were were damaged. Uh -huh. So we need something for like it's an office. So they're working on getting out at all the locations right now. Since it's going to be summer months, they they need somewhere to sit and get out of the weather. Okay. So we'll once we get that in place and debris concluded then we'll open it back up normal operations We're, our target is you know beginning of may okay good one more may before we open up our dump sir begin of may before we open our dump set may, yes it's it's open right now to household goods only um but um we'll open it back to normal operations we're shooting for may okay oh uh, one more thing about the, I see Doc's back, I don't know if he knows anything, but about the, the retrieving any more caskets, y'all know anything about is that has any more been retrieved or how many's missing or? Um, at the task force, isn't it? Yeah, do they, have, do they have all that? I was just, different ones have asked me about it and um, just going by the graveyards and just wondering how many's, does anybody know? Can we find out? We can get an update from the cemetery task force. Ryan Cedarman is uh, our contact, and we can. I'll give him a call after this meeting. If you don't mind, because a lot of people are asking how many caskets are still out there. What's and, uh, and most of you noticed with their staging area is where Creole Elementary School was. Right. That's where they're having uh, all of their uh, whatever it is they're preparing the bodies for reburial and identifying everything. Everything is happening right there in at the old Creole Elementary School. Well, how right? long before they can, I wonder, like Uncle Didi is there, I mean, how long before they can take him and go stick it back, ranch in here, you know? That's gonna be a Cedarman question. We'll call him after this meeting. Okay. If you want to. Okay, thank you, Penny. Review agenda, y'all. Let's see. On the other permits, A, that, uh. What is, what is that about? So they're having, of course, some drainage issues um, whenever they did uh, open their mitigation bank. No, oh, where, where is this at? So it is south of East Calcam Line. Okay. South of Calcam Line. Mm -hmm. Right south. So this is, is this the group, Joe, by you? Yeah, I actually talked to um, Jake McCain, who is on the gravity drainage board. Yes. And he is um, he is good with this project. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't even know where this. Yeah, you know, I mean, I don't got a section map at the house, so I was trying to figure out where. Well, I think this mitigation bank may have been put into place maybe four or five years ago. So um, they have they're having some drainage issues, so they're having to do these low water crossings. Um, but the, it's all within their right of way, so um, 
and like I said, I, I did get in touch with the truck gravity drainage board because I know how they uh, like to have their eyes well, in the yeah. mitigation bank project. So <laughs> it's, oh. it's it's all okay with them. Okay. Uh, then on, I, had, uh, I had a question on number six. Is this a new permit? Uh, I think we've already approved one where they were doing storage already. Is this right, a new Right, it is. It's just um, they are having to reauthorize it from the 2014 permit. Okay. Um, and they are doing some amendments. So it's so. the same one? Yes, sir, okay. pretty much. On uh, 7D for Roy Bellaby, is, uh, I hope we can, he can get that. That can be approved pretty quick so we can haul all that debris instead of burying it. We can haul right. and put it there and fill these holes up. I know the agent, uh, Mr. Jay Lahey with Encore Environmental, is working very closely with the EQ on this, so it looks like everything's going to be favorable. Um, mm. So hopefully um, we don't have to use this anytime soon. But well, no, all that stuff. It is a got, good project. Well, for, all that stuff in Sweet Lake, instead of burying it, you haul it and Right, it exactly. So it's a good project to reclaim our chenilles. So, um, yeah, it looks like it's going to go through. Yeah, not for next time, for this time. All that, I, every time I pass by then, I see all that. Right. It burns my, you know what? I think we could be filling these holes up down here. Right. I don't know the exact turnaround on the permit author authorization, but um, I know things are moving, but I can get an update. Okay. Is that time? Yeah, uh, there was a pile up up there, like in Grand Lake and these other facilities. We're still not sure they're going to bear it there. They, they, they separated there, but they, right. if they don't right. have a permit to bear it, they're going to have to haul it somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, That's what I'm saying with hauling. I think they're going to reduce it or separate it and reduce it yeah, there, right. and then the the side and then they got a. If he don't get a, but permit. he's trying to get a permit though, ain't he? Yeah, he, yeah. he will have a disposal burial permit. Mm -hmm. He will have it. Yes, sir. That's a bunch of baloney. We I'm got all these holes to fill up, put these stack. No, I'm holes talking about Roy Bailey. Which oh, okay, okay. I thought you was good. Danny's yeah. going to get that barrel, barrel up there instead of hauling these holes down here. Well, he is going to, he does, he, he is. is. Mm -hmm. I know he filed off for one. Yes, but yes, sir, he is. Because it make, don't make any sense. We got all these holes down here to be filled up. Mm -hmm. They've washed out, we've been spent over $2 million on that Front Ridge Road over the years. And it's washed out again. It's, because of the pit. Yeah. yeah. Well, with the, uh, the private property debris removal, um, we may can utilize this. Side. I don't know why you can't, because it's being done in Grand Chenier on the same ridge. You're, filling, you're putting everything in there. Mm -hmm. Why we can't do it on the Front Ridge? And reclaim the schneers. The road, yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Anybody have anything? Yeah, item number 16. We had discussed uh, at one point in time uh, hiring an engineer to be on staff. Is this going to be in lieu of that? No, sir. We're still going to talk about the engineer uh, idea in our finance meeting. This is going to be something separate. This is a uh, we want to have an engineer on staff pre-disaster, especially, to assist with damage assessments and to assist the permit department in doing their substantial damage estimates. Uh, what FEMA can't hire someone to come in and do, we want to be in control of that. We're going to have our own people doing it. Okay. What was that, Sonny? Which one you asked? 16. About? Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. I, I, I was thinking about something else, but is that the one we can hire our own engineer? Right. No, sir. Uh, no. 16 is not for to replace a parish engineer oh this yes is, yes this what? is related to just uh, disaster recovery type okay. stuff but we want to have them procured and we want to have them before this summer actually so uh, instead of having to rely on FEMA to hire someone to come in do all the substantial damage estimates we are going to hire our firm that we have on contract okay. to do that well how about I thought we were going to put on this on the agenda about a finance meeting yes sir after this, we have a finance meeting. We're going to talk about it. Can we still add it on to the agenda? Yes. 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 Okay. As long as we can add it on to the agenda. Yes, sir. All right. Explain 17. 17. Okay. I was waiting for you guys to get to this. <laughs> so I know the governor is has already uh, moved us into phase three, so this is um, almost irrelevant. But with the climate of, of COVID and how things quickly change, um, he has this option to, if you meet the 5% uh, community spread threshold, you could opt 
out of his phase and uh, allow your uh, bars to have uh, on-site consumption and stuff. So um, because that could change from week to week, if there was a, a chance that we met that threshold in the future and it was in between a meeting, then we would have to wait for the meeting to file it, to get permission to file it, which means maybe by the time the meeting came around, we might not meet that threshold again. So this is just kind of a contingency plan that if you think as a jury, any time that if we have to move back to phase two, phase one, whatever it is, if we ever meet that 5% community spread, would you like for me to file the paperwork on your behalf? That's what this is for. And if it's something that's not important to you, if you want to follow the, the governor's mandates, and even if we do get to five percent, less than 5% community spread, you still don't want to allow any um, on-site consumptions in any of our bars, then you just vote no against it. We need to help our businesses out. That's what I feel. Um, but this is something that we never considered because we never got to that threshold. I think we could be getting close. And then as the summer, comes on you know we just we don't want to have our bars waiting on us to call a special meeting to opt in if, if our numbers are better than the rest of the state so that's what this is it's to allow me to do it when we meet the threshold how did we get to that five percent is that something that, uh -huh. it's a formula um, that they now how do we pick five percent that we once we meet that threshold well, it's determined by uh, it's determined by the Office of Public Health that they know when you meet that threshold or, or okay. not. And that's right now, by the cases that you have. Yeah, yeah, and it's as a percentage of positive COVID tests per test taken, not per population. Right, we have never been below five percent in the last year. Um, we may never, or we might. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to say, but. Do what you is wanna, the re so reason behind that? Is because we didn't do enough testing. Well, I mean, there's. I hate to make assumptions, but I don't think it's really enough enough testing. It's just typically our residents don't go to the doctor unless they're sick, and so there's more likely that they're going to test positive. We and don't have people that go get tested. All that north part of the parish that, you, that goes and does business in Lake Charles with their doctors and everything, is that added to our totals? That's, yes, sir. It they go is. by zip code um, and address. Oh, okay. I mean, it's not a perfect system. I think uh, there were times that maybe we were assigned some positive tests that weren't really ours, but um, there's not really much we can do about that. It's just their system. They're trying to, to clear it up and do their tracking better and confirming addresses, not letting them use PO boxes, that sort of thing. But um, that's all this is. It's just if for the rest of the year, if we ever get to a point where we're less than that 5%, would you want to opt in or to this process or not? And so the, the state, the parishes that currently have it as of March 2nd that do this was Point Capee, East Carroll, Vernon, Abul, St. Mary, Orleans, Rapids, Wynn, Acadia, Jefferson Parish, Jefferson Davis Parish, Lafayette, Grant, and West Feliciana Parish. So other parishes do do it. A lot of them don't. It's, it's really your decision. Um, something to think about. Like I said, if, if you want to opt in to allow on-site consumption in bars, and the the occupancy limits change those. Take then it you away. Vote yes, and if you don't want to do that, then you vote no. I say yeah. We get them back to work. Them. Get them people back to work. Get them to make some money. Yeah, but I I I, I think you're missing that. I think she's saying it would shut them down if we got to that point. Am I right? Open them up. Open them up. Open them up. We would be open allowed to open more. Yes, yeah. five percent. Yeah, open them up. Or if you still want it to be brought to you before you do it, then you still vote no and say no. Every meeting, if we're eligible, let us vote on it. Uh, and open them up. The open president. them up. Let them open in bars. Well, I don't think there's a bar around. Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, I, let, actually, let, let somebody uh, open a bar up. There's none around at all. Does Hackberry have anything? Yes. Yeah, Hackberry does. Yeah, there's, there's a, there is a bar in Hackberry Hack that asked Hack us Hack to look into this and do this. That's what let we brought it to your attention. Right. Y'all good? Everybody's good? Anybody got any advice? Anybody? Ma'am? I have three. Okay. We're going to have three add-ons. Number one is going to be the President Authority to sign a resolution um, giving authority to 
statutes in there here. Granting authority for the president to submit all necessary documents in connection with the community block development grant for the Mormon Foundation Induction Relief Project. We're also going to have. Um, what is that? So I would like to uh, comment on this project. So um, really exciting news for the parish. Um, this project has been trying to get funded for about six years now. So it's a $25 million project. Um, this project was uh, in the pre-application phase of the Louisiana Watershed Initiative. And the state Office of Community Development had some DOR funds. Um, and they will be funding the full approved. Uh, this project has been fully approved for $25 million. And we just received the CEA draft yesterday afternoon at 3 o'clock. What is it? What is the so project? So the project, um, project includes three water control structures, upgrades to the East End lock structures, installation of the two water control structures on Rockefeller Refuge, and also they will be doing some uh, marsh restoration from the dredging of the Joseph Harbor Canal and numerous drainage structures crossing Highway 82. Um, and also doing some modification and upgrades to several channels that they will be connected to convey stormwater across 82 into the East End Locks into Joseph Harbor out to the primary outlet inlet. So uh, primary drainage outlets of the Gulf of Mexico. So it's a huge project it's, and- you Gotta watch them because sometimes they sneak stuff in like that. Well, <laughs> yeah, but it is a good project for all the parishes north. Um, you know, it's, it's really a large scale. It's going to reduce a lot of uh, these, the stormwater, rainwater, high, you know, high rainfall uh, events from the 2016 event that occurred. Oh, and especially when they get that air coastal drift. Right. <laughs> uh, they're working on that. So, I mean, it is a $25 million project. Um, the funds are, it's, it's a CDBG funded project, not parish funds. So, um, thank you. Thank you. They, they improve, it, improve it drainage early. They're going to, Going to lower the level than in there go. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Also, um, let's see what item is it. Thirteen on the agenda, voting agenda. We just had the electronic coastwide uh, vote for the Clipper program. Uh, we're in the PPL thirty-one stage, and out of the four regions, they select twenty-two projects. So. Um, out of these 22 projects, only 10 candidate projects will be selected to evaluate uh, at the Spring Technical Committee held on April 1st. So through the electronic coastwide vote, the projects nominated in the Mermintal Basin uh, was Gulf Shore Protection at Beach Prong, which is the same design, rock design, as the Rockefeller Refuge, the ME18 project. So that's been, um, a nominated project for about three to four years now so it finally made it through the electronic coastwide vote so that is we're very proud of that Capuchu Basin had two projects Mud Lake South Marsh creation and East Cove Marsh creation so um, like I said this uh, meeting will take place April 1st and we have a resolution of support of all of all three of these projects to submit to the lead agencies that have nominated these projects so you know, I'll keep you. The first one is the expansion of the rock project. Right. It's a three mile uh, rock protection. <clears throat> rock fell. Yep. It, I mean, we're, we don't know if it's going to be, you know, fully go through the, the full process yet, but it, it has been nominated. So we will um, know more April 1st to see what projects will, will go through. And out of the 10 projects, the final projects that will be selected is four. So and that, that's going to be chosen at the Winter Technical Committee, which is held in December. So it's very important that we stay involved, stay active um, in these meetings. So I might tag one of you along with me, okay. if you don't <laughs> mind, Mr. President. <laughs> OK. Thank um, you. Did you have some more, B, or is it or? No, two more add ones. That's okay. Then. The second add on is going to be to um, authorize parish staff to work on parish time for the long term recovery group and hire one part time intern to head up this group. The third one is going to be an executive session that Mr. Tom Barrett needs for Priola versus the police jury. 
Mr. Tom, you want to explain what that's going to encompass, please? I'm asked that it be added on because uh, we need to take action and uh, probably could have done it without executive session, but just to be safe, if you had questions, we need to discuss in executive session. But there's a conflict with my office and uh, uh, Randy Goodlow's office. So the police jury was sued by Priola. So Priola is a plaintiff, the police jury is a defendant, and over the construction of the sheriff's jail office. The police jury, third party, the architect, Goodlow, and there's some problems there between my office and Goodlow, legal conflicts, so you have to hire our special counsel, so I just had not want to have that discussion with you. And, and there's a timing issue, so I didn't want to wait till the next month because we really need to get the new counsel involved on some issues. So, okay. okay, thank you, Tom. Anything else, Mary? The only one thing before we ask the wife to adjourn, uh, is every, I know every year we always had our, our little wish list on these highways and stuff, back way back when. Now we have our own state representative uh, and all the traffic we have now from uh, Cameron to um, all the way to Gibstown Bridge and of course on the other side of Gibstown it's you got some nice shoulders up there but um, and we used to put it in I don't know, uh, on a state wish list every year or something to widen not only here but also in Gulf and Grand Lake and Hackberry and you know widen everything but Especially with all the, I know all the traffic, Stephen and 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 Curtis and, and all of them having Hackberry with the plants there, Johnson Bayou, and also down here. Uh, uh, I'm just, Ron, I'm just kicking that around. I don't know if you could help us out on something like that, maybe. And maybe we got these nice big plants and going to be having more, maybe, or the safety. Uh, so what I think you're referencing is the state highway priority program. Um, typically between November and January of each year the parishes are allowed to submit projects to DOTD and they begin their planning and design process um, I, I do know from reviewing the parishes submittals to capital outlay so separate from DOTD highway priority program which is submitted every year which is what just funded from Boone's Corner to Hackett's Corner that overlay uh, that's the same program uh, the capital outlay process, I, I think your staff submitted two uh, grant requests. One for overlay and shoulders of 27 from the red light to Gibstown, and then elevating 27 uh, north of Hackberry uh, as an evacuation route, the issue of water over top in that stretch of highway. Both of those, I think, have been submitted uh, to capital LA, even though that's not a parish project, that's DOTD's responsibility, but you as a governing body, a local governing body are saying, look, this is important to our people. We want you to start looking at this. Mm -hmm. And so those projects, I think, have been submitted. They're in the queue. It takes time to get those, you know, the design moving. Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, that highway priority program could be as simple as a, as a letter from the staff or a letter from the jury collectively. <coughs> with your priorities submitted for the record. Uh, prior to COVID, they would have regional face-to-face -face meetings. Now they've started doing virtual meetings. But I, I assure you at any point in time when you have a priority, the staff could even just send an email to, to Melinda Frith with my office. We'll make sure that the secretary and, and his uh, traffic engineers get, get those, get those so projects. Just, just as an update or, or just the question of a a date period so the the request would highlight your needs and that would get the process started the public meetings are set between November and January every year so you know instead of waiting until November if you wanted to get the staff to do that now we can we can flag it now and when those discussions start we don't have to come back and say oh we forgot and now we need to I'd really like to have the one from Highbury because this thing's been going on for a very, very, very long time, and uh, every hurricane season we got problems. I mean, you know, uh, which blockades the road. Even once it's once the storm's gone, you know, with all the, the material that's on top of that road. Uh, so, like I said, it, it's a problem that we have, and we really need to get it done. And I imagine the other the other uh, job is, is is priority too. I'd really like to get that push forward somehow. Yes, 
sir. On well, while I have the mic, give us an update. Yeah, he wasn't gonna get rid of me. Um, session starts April twelfth. It's gonna be a fiscal session this year. A lot of uh, this should be a concerted effort on tax reform on a wide range of bills. It's going to be quick. It's gonna be fast paced. It's only sixty days total uh, from start to finish. Um, so you're gonna see quite a quite a bit of bills thrown about. And uh, I do serve on the Ways and Means Committee, so we will hear those tax bills. Uh, if you have any questions on those, you can uh, funnel those through staff or just reach out to me directly. Perfectly fine taking calls at, at any time. Uh, I know one thing that has been ongoing here is insurance issues. Um, I know it's unfortunate that since Katrina Rita, we have we as a state and an insurance department haven't improved this process. So what I think you're gonna see this session is you're gonna see some bills being filed to try and adjust this. So what you're gonna see from the insurance uh, agent perspective is, well, you know, you're gonna throw things out of whack, you're gonna upset the market by changing this and changing that. So there's gonna be a, a, a level of, con of consideration for throwing the entire market out of whack. But at the same time, we all can, bless you, we could all realize the status quo is unacceptable. And so when you have locals that are expected or homeowners are expected to understand a 30 page policy, what they're allowed to do, not allowed to do, the procedure, so forth and so on, it's too much. And when we had a, a joint committee meeting in December, um, I was able to set up meetings with the insurance commissioner and his staff. We've learned quite a few uh, new pieces of information since then especially as it relates to the adjuster issue. Uh, the, the main concern I've heard across the district, and if you've heard separate, please let me, uh, differently, please let me know, the number of adjusters, desk and field adjusters assigned on one policy has been a problem across the parish. Um, and, and I know of one family that had four field adjusters and two desk adjusters. And, and unfortunately, what is typically happening is adjuster one sees things differently from adjuster two and adjuster three and adjuster four. So the homeowner fights to get things in adjuster number three's pop report, and then adjuster four sees everything different. You basically start back over from scratch. So there's certain things that the, the governor and the insurance commissioner has some discretion in times of emergency that they're able to tweak. We want to codify that and put that in legislation to, to make sure that we have those uh, options available in the time of a storm. Uh, other bills, more reform type bills, may be difficult to have, but those discussions need to happen. We have to have, we have, to have an avenue for the people's issues to be heard in, in that big building in Baton Rouge. And so, will we get things changed? We really don't know. But there will be legislation after talking to other legislators and independent agents and the insurance commissioner and his staff. You're, you're going to see some efforts, uh, no, no doubt about it. So please, please keep us. Uh, we may even request some, some testimony in those committee meetings. It's always helpful to hear you know, the horror stories. It's helpful for those other folks. In fact, one of the gentlemen that was looking at filing a piece of legislation from North Louisiana, and so he reached out whenever he was uh, attempting to file it and said, Ryan, would you mind giving me some examples? He said, I know the technical side, but I need to know what you people are going through. And so he has a background in insurance. So he understands what I don't understand, and we have the stories to illustrate what the issues are. And so uh, I think you're going to see something come forward on that regard. Uh, we're also going to remain focused on hurricane recovery efforts. Um, you know, in the event that a disaster recovery CDBG uh, appropriation is made from the federal government to the state. We will work with Pat Forbes at the Office of uh, Community Development Disaster Recovery Unit every step along the way to make sure your projects are, are getting full consideration, that the money's going in the right places. Um, and one last uh, thing before I, I, I entertain any questions. Uh, Senator Cassidy should be introducing either today or very soon a bill to adjust GoMesa revenues. So as you know, the parish uh, has received direct funds from the federal government as part of its oil and gas leases in the Gulf of Mexico. 
Uh, those formulas are according to population and shoreline, which we do well on the shoreline side. We don't do too well on the population side. But that revenue stream is what helped to fund the Rutherford Beach shoreline project, the Long Beach shoreline project. And so Senator Cassidy's staff reached out uh, for a letter of support from, from the district office uh, for this reinvesting in shoreline economies and ecosystems program. What he wants to do is lift the cap on Gold Mesa. Right now it's capped at $375 million, I believe. We get our, a portion of the 375 million. He said he doesn't want that cap. He, whatever those revenues are, we should get a portion of that, according to the formula, a portion of whatever that level is. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the sequestration. So uh, the federal government, when they have a program such as this one based off of leases, they take their three to five percent or whatever that number is, admin fee off the top. So before they even start distributing the funds for coastal projects, they're taking a portion of that uh, right off the top. He wants to do away with that. If the funding is that important and that critical, it needs to stay whole. The last issue is Gomesa was effective uh, 2006. What he is asking is for all oil and gas leases from 2000 to 2006 also be included in future projections. Uh, th those impacts didn't stop. Those benefits to the federal, uh, federal coffers, uh, you know, were still going on from, from 2000 to 2006. So he's asking for an expansion of that. Um, in the letter, uh, the, the parish should be very proud. I included photos of the Rutherford Beach project and the Long Beach project. Rutherford Beach Project post Lauren Delta. Just so the federal delegation has the ammunition, uh, I, I think the, the first large uh, allocation was either in 2018, I believe, was the, the Paris's first receipt of, a, of, a, of an appropriation that was more than $10,000. It was significant. You bonded that money out and said, look, we're not going to wait. We're going to get those projects constructed instead of letting annually let that uh, roll forward. Um, so those projects were used as examples to say, look, the locals have it together. Uh, those projects were constructed in two years time and put in place. And without those projects, what would Rutherford Beach have looked like, you know, after Laura and Delta. And so some of the photos from Long Beach were incredible. I think it was com completed in November and there's already land between the initial set of rocks on Long Beach Road, all the way protruding out into the Gulf to the protection. I mean, it's already filled in. The land, land is being created already. So I thought it was important that Cameron's projects are being highlighted as part of a federal push uh, to increase Gulf-wide Gulf revenues. And so uh, with that, I will, uh, uh, one more thing. I'm looking at having a pre-session survey to go out across the whole district. And so some of these items are going to be in there. You're going to see people start talking about a new gas tax. Uh, they're going to tell you the gas tax hadn't been increased since the late 80s. Uh, so I want to hear from you all. I'm sure I, I will. I already see some of y'all nodding. Uh, is that a yes as in be supportive? Just keep going. Just keep going. Okay. <laughs> so, so we'll have a, we're trying to draft a pre-session survey. That'll go out in the mail to you, and you can send those back. That way we can track it throughout session. Uh, just to understand, to make sure we have some of those thoughts in writing. Uh, with that, I'll entertain any questions. I got one. Uh, you, you heard us uh, speak from Blue Cross Blue Shield a while ago about our COVID situation. Is there anything in the state workings that might help the communities uh, deal with that? So I think whatever was allocated COVID-related in previous tranches of funds all went to COVID expenses. Now, I don't think the state really specified on you know, uh, employee and personnel insurance versus uh, supplies and things of that sort. Moving forward, I think that you know, the 1.9 trillion package, that thing is liable to change a, a few times between now and then. I don't think the senators in DC know what's in, in that package, much less, much less me or people in Baton Rouge, just to be, you know, just to be honest. I think uh, noting it today will be helpful and I will reach out to uh, Commissioner Darden's office, um, who is developing the state's budget right now. He administers the COVID-related recovery dollars. So I'll reach out to his <coughs> office uh, and, and the Office of Public Health just to see if they are aware uh, of anything regarding those two programs. Thank you. Yes, 
Yes. Going back to insurance, okay? Um, I just heard our insurance commissioner speak up this this week. Uh, for six months, we didn't hear anything from any insurance company. Uh, most of the people in Cameron Parish suffered for six months, six, without hearing anything from their insurance company. Now, this is not aimed at you. This is aimed at whoever needs to know this. All right. For six months, everybody suffered. Couldn't hear anything. Their houses sit there, and some people they could have saved their homes within the first month or two. Now they have to destroy their homes because they were destroyed over the six months. I want to know, and since you mentioned insurance, I would I'd just like to know how legally they can sit back on their dust and do nothing. So we had too many people suffering in, in the last six months. We've lost. 50% of the homes that we've lost is because they sit there for six months. And that's, that's not right. These people pay their premiums, did all the work, <coughs> tried to save their homes, and they couldn't. This is wrong. I, I, I agree with you. And I, and I think that what you're going to what you're gonna see is people look very closely. Uh, the response of, well, things are what they are, and you can't change it. And, you know, that's... that's not acceptable, and that's not how anyone needs to function, regardless of what, what the issue is. Um, in the regard, in regards to the timing, um, there are certain things, discretionary and otherwise, that were allowed to happen after the storm. Uh, that first notice of claim, uh, for me, balancing out the public adjusters versus your insurance company's adjusters versus hiring an engineer versus hiring an attorney. I mean, it's complicated for me. Uh, going back to the marketing effort with the, with the insurance commissioner himself, uh, he said, look, my office is there to take complaints, and that's how these should be uh, provided. I asked him, well, how many complaints? Well, it's not a lot of complaints, okay? If there's 300,000 claims in the entire state, I said, Mr. Commissioner, no offense. But there are people in my family that think I'm a, I'm a representative in Washington, D.C., not in Baton Rouge. So don't be offended when they don't realize who you are and what you do. Uh, so I think awareness to homeowners before the storm event. It doesn't have to be, you know, once the storm happens, people are trying to move on with their lives. So we as a state and a department need to do better in informing the public on what options are out there. I think one thing that I've learned about this public adjuster when you have this appraisal process that comes in, you can have, have your own appraiser come when you disagree with your adjuster. There are certain timelines that are relevant that normal policyholders just don't realize. We don't trigger just from a lack of, of, of knowledge. And so I, I think there, there are some things that doesn't even have to be in legislation. It could be making people aware of what their options are and what timing is relevant to those options. He did not produce himself. He did not produce himself out there to help the people that was having the problem. That's my problem with him. That's my problem with the insurance uh, commission. Totally. We got people that lost their homes. You realize? Uh, you're one of them. We have uh, 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 the, the people in Cameron Parish that lost their home was because they had to sit there. Now, some of them got taken away initially. But the rest of them, there was no sense of them just sitting there. And our, our insurance commissioner or whoever should have been busy and making sure that these people got out there and do their job did not. That's my opinion. That's Curtis Fountain speaking. Well, and, and you know that there's you going to tell there's, I said so. There's other avenues. Well, we can set up a meeting. and uh -huh. uh -huh. be, be happy to talk to him. Uh, because it's important from here to hear, from, for him to hear from the locals also. Mm -hmm. um, if you go back to Katrina Rita, there were you know, items of litigation where homeowners were awarded punitive damages for a lack of action and lack of preparation on behalf of some companies. So that is, not to say that that will happen guaranteed, but that is another, another avenue. Um, yes, sir? One, one thing, I spoke to uh, the insurance commissioner a, a couple of times while I was president. And he said that his hands were tied in a lot of cases where he couldn't even force mediation. So the only reason I'm bringing this up is that he may be trying to do a job, but you guys need to take the handcuffs off and give him the, the, the power to do what he needs to do for the people of the, of the state. 
So you're talking about redoing some some uh, some of this wording. So just take that, you know, you can bring our arguments with you. Got it. And uh, Ryan, I don't know if you know this, but we do have an agenda item, uh, item 12, which is a resolution you're going to vote on that does, uh, it will be directed to the legislature and request a reform and um, some transparency legislative reform at this session. So that's something that's on the agenda, item 12, we're going to vote on this afternoon. Give the dogs a tea. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan. Nothing else? Appreciate it. No, no intercoastal? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Yeah, go to sleep. Please. One day I'll find out <laughs> what that number is. Yeah, well, before you adjourn, I just wanted to uh, introduce, um, we, we hired an architect firm. If you recall, we procured uh, firms to come in and assist with designing uh, assessments of the buildings and designing new buildings, consolidating buildings. And they're actually in our audience today. Do you want to introduce yourself there? Absolutely. Derek Forche, Forche May Architects. We JV with Domain Architects. Joey, Joey Wild. Wild. And so it's important for the public to know that if you see someone that you don't know around our uh, public buildings, they have permission to be there. <laughs> they work for us. How about David over there? He's sitting quiet. <laughs> I'm just sitting here trying to look pretty. No, uh, we're a consultant with the Forche May team, so we're helping out with the structural civil components, foundations, whatever we're trying to do. Glad to have you back. Well, David, David, David was here for a good while. Yes, so. sir. And he lets us. <laughs> I was just in Lake Charles. Oh, okay. <laughs> Does anybody else have anything else? Or Katie have anything else? Anybody? Good. Meetings adjourned then. <laughs>